This is a 10-day itinerary for Japan. An ideal itinerary for any first-timers in the country who would like to get a taste of what Japan is about since this is focused on the big three cities, the most popular and the most visited, Tokyo, Kyoto, and Osaka. But before we get this video going, hit that like button, subscribe to my channel for more travel videos like these, and let's jump right into it. First, I feel the need to say this, but I don't know why I waited for so long to visit Japan, but it has become one of my favorite countries I've traveled to. This is a place I've been wanting to go to for the longest time and I cannot believe I am here. The culture, the food, the sights, the cleanliness, the beauty of its history and the architecture. In addition, the people here are amazing and their respect towards others is something I've never experienced. The constant respect I received from start all the way to the end when I was flying out of the country was amazing. Even the airline traffic control bowed to everyone on the plane to show respect as we left. Depending on where you're coming from, I highly suggest flying into Narita International Airport in Tokyo as you'd most likely get inexpensive flights to the country as this airport serves as an international hub, the main international gateway of countries worldwide. The airport might get overwhelming once you land, but don't be. The local train transportation in the country is actually really easy to use even with minimal English writings or directions, though I do recommend using Google Maps to help you navigate your way around. I mean, you could take the taxi from the airport into the city or where you're staying, but where's the fun in that? Let's get you to take the train. Once you've cleared your gate and have your luggage, you're going to head down. So from here, the first thing you should do is get a rechargeable IC card. This is what's used on the majority of the train lines here. Once you get this, don't throw it away as they are valid for 10 years. So next time you head back to the country, which I'm pretty sure you will, you can just use this again. There are two main cards, Suica and Pasmo. I ended up getting the Pasmo card. Once you've purchased the card and topped it up, head to the train platforms and find your way to the place you're staying at. Depending on the time your plane lands or when you get to your place, you can just get settled in, roam around the area just to get a feel for it. Or maybe you got there extremely late so you would just be resting up. And that would wrap up the first Day. day two is when your adventure begins. We're gonna kick off the Tokyo itinerary by hitting the things to do up north. First up is Nizu Shrine. The entrance here is free. This is one of the oldest shrines in the country that was established in 1705. Aside from it being a tourist attraction, it is also a popular venue for Japanese weddings as well as it is home of the Bunkyu Azalea Festival. I probably just butcher that name. Then your next stop will be Akihabara, also known as Electric Town since it's only a 15 minute train ride from the shrine. Akihabara is a vibrant shopping hub specializing mainly in manga and anime games, and anything electronics really. This is the place for all your electronic needs. The next two are optional and you may include them if you like, but they are Sensoji and Tokyo Skytree. Then that should take you at the end of the day. But if you do decide to skip it, your next stop is Imperial Palace. The admission is free. The palace was built on the grounds of the Edo Castle. It was the official residence of the Japanese Emperor. The stone bridges dates all the way back to the Meiji period and one of the garden features 230 different types of trees. Once you're done at Imperial Palace, you'll head to He Shrine, which closes at 5 p.m. Them, but you should have enough time to make it here and explore the place before they close for the day. The establishment of this place is uncertain. Some say 1478, while others say 1362. The admission here is also free. And then the last stop is the Tokyo Tower. I recommend coming here in the evening as the tower lights up. You may also come here for the daytime if you like, but I think it's better to go at night. The tower stands at 333 meters or 1,092 feet. You may admire the tower from afar, or you could go up the main deck for 1,200 Japanese yen, which is around 11 Canadian dollars or 8 US dollars. Then there's the other option of getting up to the top deck for 2,800 Japanese yen, which is roughly around 26 Canadian dollars or 19 US dollars. It seems pretty obvious, but the design is inspired by the Eiffel Tower in France. This structure was built in 1958. After a day of adventuring, you may end your day at Pokemon Cafe before grabbing dinner. Day three, you're gonna kick off the day by visiting another shrine, Meiji Jingu. The construction began in 1915 and opened in 1920. Dedicated to the Emperor Meiji, out of the 8,000 Shinto shrines in Japan, and this is by far the most famous one. This shrine was destroyed during the World War II, but it was rebuilt and then reopened in 1958. The admission here is free. Next, you're gonna head up the Shinjuku area. The first stop here is the Tokyo Government Building. This is the tallest building in Tokyo, standing at 243 meters or 797 feet, with 48 floors. It's designed by a Japanese architect, Kenzo Tange. The construction started at 1988, then opened in 1991. It offers panoramic views of the city. The admission here is free. The next is Kabukicho. It's a 
famous entertainment district best known for adult-oriented nightlife with clubs, pubs, and late-night eats, just to name a few. Then depending on how you feel or if you have time, you're more than welcome to check out the 2D Cafe and a place called Harajuku, which is a vibrant street filled with youth, fashion, and vintage clothing stores. Before heading to Shibuya Crossing, check out Omode Yokocho, which is also known as Memory Lane and Piss Alley, a place that started out as a black market after the World War II. This place is a landmark narrow alleyway that has over 60 tiny bars and restaurants, a place featuring a selection of food stalls. This is the go-to destination for all sorts of unique and authentic Japanese food experience. Then once you get some dinner here, it's time to hit up the busiest street intersection in the world, Shibuya Crossing. There are over 2.4 million people that cross this here on a daily. It is one of the most iconic landmarks in the country. And if you happen to be here during the rainy season, the umbrella scramble is a must see. Day four, you'll be traveling to Kyoto by train, which takes about two and a half hours. You won't be able to use the regular IC car that you purchase, so you have to purchase a separate one-way ticket for the bullet train, which is around 13,000 Japanese yen, roughly around 139 Canadian dollars or 102 US dollars. The bullet trains go up to speeds of over 300 kilometers per hour. It's fairly fast, but it will probably be the smoothest train ride you've ever gone on. Once you get settled in, you'll be checking out Ninenzaka. The roads here are paved by ancient stones. Both Ninenzaka and Sanenzaka are iconic streets of Kyoto that represents the traditional environment of the country. A famous tourist attraction with traditional buildings, shops, cafes, and so much more. And just about a 10 minute walk is Yasaka Shrine, dedicated to Sasanu as its chief kami. The construction of this place began in 656. It became the object of imperial patronage during the Heian period, a place known for its summer festival, the Gion Matsuri, which takes place in July. Next up is Pontocho Park. It's a cool spot with small shops, restos, and local stores. This place is very narrow and it's also by the river. A good place to just go for a walk and chill out. As you head into day five, the first stop is Nishiki Market, often referred to as Kyoto's Kitchen that started in 782. Back then, it had a cold water source in the area which made it possible for vendors to sell. Now, the fresh food market is over five blocks long. After you're done at the market, the Kiyomizu Dera Temple is the next site to visit. The name was derived from the waterfall within the property that runs off from the hills. It's comprised of several temples and it was close to becoming one of the new seven wonders of the world in 2007, but came up short so it was not picked. This wraps up day five and make sure you rest up as for day six, you're gonna have to wake up really early to avoid the crowd at one of the most picturesque and iconic spots in Kyoto, the Arashiyama Bamboo Forest. You wanna come here early because it gets really, really busy. The place is made up of a particular type of bamboo called Moso Bamboo, a gigantic plant that is actually not from Japan, but its origin is China and Taiwan. This bamboo oozes so much tranquility that it has been classified as one of the 100 Japanese soundscapes. Once you're done at the Arashiyama Bamboo Forest, you'll head over to Tenryuji Temple since it's within walking distance. The entrance fee here is 500 Japanese yen, which is roughly around 5 Canadian dollars or 4 US dollars. This is the most important temple in Kyoto's Arashiyama district. It's ranked first as the city's five great Zen temples. It was built in 1339 by a ruling shogun named Ashikaga Takauji. Once you're done feeling all refreshed and zen at the temple, you'll head to Kimono Forest next. I recommend coming here at nighttime if possible just to see it all light up. I came here during the daytime and well, it was great but it was nothing special. It's essentially a train stop art installation with over 600 backlit pillars with colorful kimono textiles. It's definitely worth coming here during the nighttime. It's day 7 and Toji Temple is up first. This is the tallest pagoda standing at 55 meters or 187 feet. It was built in 794 and mostly known for its vibrant flea markets called Kobo-san. The entrance fee is 500 Japanese yen, which is roughly around 5 Canadian dollars or 4 US dollars. The next stop is Aeon Mall, where you could have lunch and buy some souvenirs if desired. Then after that, you'll head to Renjon Temple, a Buddhist temple known for its 1001 life-sized wooden statues of the goddess Kanon. On day 8, I suggest waking up early to get up to Fushimi Inari Shrine, the most important of several thousand shrines dedicated to Inari, the Shinto god of rice. There are a lot of fox statues in the shrine as they were Inari's messengers. This shrine has ancient origins predating the capital's move to Kyoto in 794. This place also has 10,000 Tori gates. Make sure you head all the way to the top because it is so worth it. Then if you like, you could head up to a Buddhist temple way up north, Kinakuji, but personally, I opted out of this one. Day 9, you'll head to the food capital of the country, Osaka. It'll take about an hour or so to get to Osaka from Kyoto. Once you get here, your first stop will be Umeda Sky Building. It stands at 173 meters or 568 feet tall with 40 floors. Built by Hiroshi Hara, it was originally to have four towers, but in the end having just two. The economic bubble burst forced this project to have only two buildings and it was done by 1993. To enter, it's 1500 Japanese yen and that's roughly around 14 Canadian dollars or 10 US dollars. Once you get up here, you'll get panoramic views of the city. Next up is Dotonburi. It's known for its eye-catching neon signage billboards and of course, food. 
what was once a popular theater district is now a hotspot for nightlife and entertainment. The iconic Glee Coat Running Man sign is here. This running man had glowed over Dotonburi since 1935, derived from Glee Coat's first product candy caramel that dates back since 1922. The candy is believed to give you energy to run 300 meters, hence a running man is used. That said, I highly suggest coming here during the nighttime as this is the time when this place comes alive. On the last day, you'll check out America Mura First, a place with over 2,500 shops, widely known as the epicenter of Kansai's young fashion and culture. This place used to be called Sumiya Machi, which means charcoal shop town. Once you're done here, you'll head to Shitanoji Temple, one of Japan's oldest temple and the first Japanese Buddhist temples. Founded in 593 by Prince Shotoku, who supported the introduction of Buddhism and the country. This place was built with the intention to teach Buddhism in Japan. Then your last stop will be Shensakai, a vibrant street that was established in 1912. The Coney Island of New York was the main inspiration behind the southern part and Paris for the northern side. Despite being labeled as a dangerous area, it showcases a unique identity of Osaka. Japan is a beautiful country that I see myself going back to over and over again. Aside from the three main destinations mentioned in this video, Japan has a lot more to offer so it's definitely worth planning multiple trips out here or planning a much longer stay next time around to see more of what it offers. Well that's it for this video and if you found this guide helpful make sure you give it a like and subscribe to my channel to see more travel tips and more travel videos like these. Thanks for watching and I'll see you on the next video.